Good morning or good afternoon and welcome to this um, monthly webinar um, from nine on uh, uh, cybersecurity. So today, obviously myself, Mark Orchison, founder and CEO, Adam Wilmot, and uh, warmly welcoming uh, Simi Kindola, who's the director of IT at, uh, at Hampton School. Um, and uh, for disclosure here, Simi actually wears two hats. Uh, she's also the CTO at Nine um, and responsible for the uh, development of our technology. So Simi, I just wanted to give you, if you could give everyone an introduction to, to in terms of your role at Hampton School and the type of school it is. Okay, so we're an independent school based just outside of London and we've got about one and a half thousand pupils. We're a three site um, organisation and we have, well, a fourth site because we've got a boathouse as well. And we go all the way from pre-prep up until sixth form um, and we're a one to one school. We also have um, anything up to around 3000 devices connected to the network with around 500 staff. And so it's a very busy place. Fantastic. So um, throughout the uh, the webinar today, Simi will be uh, um, uh, joining and participating, uh, contributing. We're we'll bringing into real life um, uh, the cyber challenges faced by uh, many of you in school, and not me just hypothetically uh, saying what uh, you sort of need you need to do. Um, throughout the course of the webinar, um, I you can ask questions within the questions box. Um, and I will pose those to Simi um, or to, uh, to Adam as we as we go through. Um, for those of you not familiar with the um, with how we structured these webinars, because there's quite a few people, new people joining either live or on demand, um, we typically go through the cyber vulnerabilities um, that we found in the month, and then um, uh, what are the what are, what are the key updates? And this month we are doing something slightly differently. We're sort of theming it. Um, around your your risk management obligations, um, the management of cyber risk in your data supply chain. So if you think about all those third parties that you use, either systems or providers, um, how you manage that risk. Um, talking about what an effective incident response looks like um, and then looking at how you manage your data supply chain uh, to your data. And we, we're going to provide the example of how we manage the security around the data within the app that we've that we've developed. Um, we'll look at evidencing cyber risk management through data, and um, that will all be described with the backdrop, back, backdrop of cyber in practice at Hampton School. Um, so to get started, um, I am going to provide you with some notable updates um, that are just quite useful to know um, for those not only within the European Union and the UK, but also internationally. So the first is that on um, the 5th of March to last Friday, Nine agreed a partnership or announced a partnership with Icasia um, that supports covering 2 million students across 120 uh, countries um, and includes over 3,500 independent and international schools. So that doesn't cover independent schools within the UK, um, but, 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 but it covers any independent school that is accredited by CIS, NIASC, WASC, Middle States, and those other accreditation agencies that are um, generally uh, US based. Um, at the end, we will send you a copy of all the slides and so all the hyperlinks that you see, um, you'll be able to access the content from there. And also the references that we use are also at the end of the slide deck. From a, um, from a from a data protection context, um, although these are sort of slightly uh, out of date, um, there are they're, 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 there's a theme progressing out of data protection authorities around the uh, the management of data when it comes to distance learning. Um, and whilst um, we are seeing this within Europe, we are also seeing it outside of Europe. And so you've got two examples here one from the Italian Data Protection Authority and one from the Portuguese Data Protection Authority, when they are both providing updates around the, um, uh, the, the use of online distance learning programs, one saying you need to do what's called a data protection impact assessment, the other that's saying that you don't need to do a data protection impact assessment when at a, at a European level, they should be singing off the same hymn sheet and giving the same guidance. But we're saying that you have those conflicting messages and it's something just for you to be uh, aware of. The other thing that's come about on the 22nd of February, which is just last month, um, the German court is now seeking guidance as to whether school teachers must be asked for their consent 
before giving lessons via online videos such as Zoom and Google Meet and um, obviously Teams. So um, that judgment, if it if it, if it, if it, if it, if it's if it's detailed that consent is required, then that could have a significant impact on schools across Europe, not necessarily further afield, but specifically within schools in Europe if they are using legitimate interests or another lawful basis for the um, uh, for the provision of the transfer of personal data via um, video conferencing. So a useful update for you guys to keep um, uh, aware of. Setting the context um, to the things that we're going to go through with um, Adam and Simi are your cyber obligations in data protection law. Now, I'm going to talk about the data protection law within the GDPR. Um, just as an example, it's, it's the most, um, it's the law that you can reference the most. But essentially, in, in any other country, whether you're in Thailand, Singapore, um, the developing law in Vietnam, in Brazil, um, they all have the same things. If they're not written identically, they are very, very similar. Um, and the first one is data protection by design. So within the GDPR, this is Article 25. So this basically requires you to um, consider privacy and data protection at the design phase, phase of any system, service, product, or process. So if you think about you're going to put in place a new firewall, or you're moving to SharePoint, or you're looking to put in a new wireless system or replace your MacBooks, you need to first of all consider what are the privacy and data protection issues with that technology and ensure that you've, you've put in place appropriate technical and organizational measures, that you have integrated safeguards into your processing, and you sort of bake in data protection into um, the processing activities associated with that technology and business practices. So that's like at the very beginning when you're doing a new project. So many of you will be thinking about the projects that you'll be doing over the summer. And a core component of that is the privacy implications of those projects. So that's projects before you sort of start moving forward to stuff. The second one is within security of processing, um, which is Article 32. And essentially, that is a requirement that ensures you identify and, ma and manage the privacy and data protection risk at an opera operational management level for systems, services, products, or processes, and then throughout the life cycle. And that's what we're going to be asking Simi about in terms of how they approach it at Hampton. Um, and, and Adam's going to give you some evidence in terms of what some of our schools have been doing. So we sort of averaged out the uh, a number of schools that have gone through a cyber vulnerability retest over the past um, uh, over the past month to, to look whether to see whether we can determine a trend in terms of the um, reduction in their cyber risk and of course we can do that so that's what we're gonna gonna show you when we look at what's going on in the news at this moment in time and, and Adam and Simi do feel free to jump in at any any uh, at any point in time um, there's been this big issue in the past week with Microsoft and on-premise exchange. Um, where, um, I mean, Adam, we were speaking about this earlier, apparently a number of our schools are facing this threat or we've been in touch with you to say that there are potential issues here. Um, can you explain a bit more? Yeah, and I've never received as many emails as I have about this issue with the vulnerability for Microsoft. I was bombarded last week with emails um, alerting me to this vulnerability. And first and foremost, I just want to make sure we can get, you know, this message as far and wide as possible because people are being compromised by this vulnerability. So if if you have or know anyone who has an on-premise exchange server, the, the, they need to patch the servers following the guidance from Microsoft. And there are links at the end which will help that. But I think secondly, um, assume that you have been compromised if you have an exchange server. Um, it, by patching the server, if you have been compromised previously, you're not going to stop that compromise. So you need to kind of move into the kind of the the um, the, the uh, incident management, incident response phase. And there are links at the end of this of how to spot the um, the IOCs, the uh, indicators of compromise that would suggest you may have been compromised. If you don't have an exchange server, but you know someone who does, please point them in the direction of the links. Please try and get them to patch their servers and review. Um, Microsoft taking this very, very seriously and they're posting updates daily on uh, you know, any new findings from this vulnerability. And, and, and Simi, has this been an impact for you at Hampton? It has. So we carried out the update last week on Thursday. So Adam actually alerted our systems manager here to the incident. So. We applied the patch on Thursday and we didn't experience downtime. We are an Office 365, or sorry, Microsoft 365 school as well. 
So we do have a hybrid exchange environment. So it might be that you do have Microsoft 365 and you assume you don't have a server locally, but we do. And so quite a lot of schools will have a hybrid environment. Um, it didn't take very long. It took about an hour or so to apply the patch and make sure everything was up and running. I suppose the biggest point now is going back and working out, you know, have we been compromised? What's the incident? How do we do the assessment? So that we've actually done within the app and we're currently working through that process to determine the risk and see what we need to do. That's Brilliant. the more complicated bit, I think. Okay. And that's, that, that was using the, the Nine app, wasn't it, that you guys used to investigate the, the impact of the um, cybersecurity instance? It is. And, ju and just going on to the IOC, the ind indicators of compromise, Microsoft are making it very easy for people to identify. So it's not a long drawn out process. It can take you days. It's quite short and sharp and quick to establish that. There's a number of files that get uh, delivered onto the Exchange server locally. Um, and there's a there's a cleanup mechanism in place. So uh, it's all there at the end of the slides. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're stuck, please feel free to get in touch and we can, we can help. Okay, so with that Microsoft issue, that that is just a, sort of a larger issue. I say it's an issue that's, that that is has an impact on a on a on one of the biggest tech providers in in the world. And if you go to their compliance center, you will find all the documentation around how Microsoft protects the security of the data and also the they they protect and manage the security around their technology. Um, another useful update that came out on the 26th of January, and again, this is at the end of the, uh, and any references, is a, is a document that, that you can use to um, ask questions around your suppliers um, that uh, you have in place to, to provide you with technology or to provide you with ed tech systems or, or, or platforms. And essentially what that enables you to, to do is to gain a level of confidence as to um, how uh, how seriously your data supply chain um, essentially uh, takes cybersecurity, um, and the reason why we've got Adam here and and and, the, uh, and Simi with a, with a nine hat on is to give you an indication of actually uh, the level of detail that we'd expect those people within that supply chain to go. But this is a good starting point to, to build some capability and capacity within your own schools in terms of what you should be doing around um, uh, asking your, those questions. And they, and they break it down into these different sections. So security governance, managing and recovering from incidents. So that's, that, you know, that's very timely given um, Microsoft, protecting their network, protecting data, the offshoring of, uh, of technology, um, personal data, personal, personnel security, physical security, um, testing and insurance and, and other contractual considerations. Now, the app that we are developing that we have at the moment, the, cyber, uh, the, the data protection app, will have um, a, a, a database in it by the autumn um, that allows you to evaluate a supplier against these different things. So whilst at the moment, you know, you could start an exercise going through all of your different um, app providers um, and tech providers um, at the end of the uh, end of the autumn, um, that'll be a lot easier through the technology that we are providing. Um, Wendy's just asked, can you explain what is likely to have been compromised with the Microsoft problem um, with data have been taken? So Adam, what is the likely what is the likely compromise? You know, is it is it individual mailboxes? Is it is it you know is it um, being encrypted? What what are the issues? Typically, we see that it's um, kind of account enumeration that might be present. So people gain access to the local exchange server and they can then use that data to kind of, um, you know, to start an attack across, uh, you know, across the network. So any data that's local to the exchange server needs to be protected uh, and, you know, mounting a further wider attack across the network could also be uh, be a result of that compromise as well. Perfect. Okay. Well, just before you carry on, sorry, I'm also just going to paste in the chat another vulnerability that we had to deal with on Thursday last week as well. Um, so that was add one, which was a VMware vCenter vulnerability. So we actually had an issue with our server environment and the host. So we had to apply that update as well, which that took the entire day to do. Brilliant. Yeah. Pop if you paste that in out, that that would be useful. Gus has just asked, it's probably more for me, where can we find the DPA cases that we can use as a, as a reference? Gus, I will add those into the link at the end, um, but I believe they are in uh, they are in German, um, but I can, I'll, I'll put them in at the, at the end so 
Um, so when you get when you receive the PDF of the presentation, you'll you'll have a, you'll have the link to it, the, the, the references at the end. So in terms of practicing what we preach, when we, when we talk about our data supply chain um, um, and you know what you really should be asking of of people, I, I would ask Adam and, and Simi from a nine perspective. Um, how do we ensure that our app is secure? So, so Adam, what do we do? Uh, we, we make sure our data is encrypted. So any of the, the data that we hold within the app is encrypted. So we have encrypted channels of communication across our platform and the uh, databases we hold are encrypted at rest. So, so the first and foremost, encrypt, encrypt the data. Those databases we do have are firewall protected. So we only allow certain IP addresses to communicate with them. So uh, we have a secure mechanism for connecting to the databases with a dedicated IP address through VPNs. And that ensures that we know that the only IP addresses or the only uh, clients that can connect to it have to have the IP address. And that's not publicly known. We also limit the connectivity between the app and the database via protected channel. So whilst it's on a, you know, a, a public cloud environment, we can secure that by only allowing certain IPs to connect to it. We make sure that we monitor and we alert on the application. We have a number of application environments. We have development, QA, security testing, stage. You know, we have a whole raft of different. So just, so just, 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 just on that point there. So if, if you're not familiar with software development, and of course I, I did not know what we were doing when we went into we're going to build an app. Um, I just thought you just did some code and plugged, plonked it on the server, and then you no, know, away you go. But if we found out that actually that's not the case, so I found out that's not the case. <laughs> and what you do is they develop the developers develop individually, right? And then you sort of like there seems to be like a sequence. You go from like one box to the next box, to the next box, to the next box, and the sort of the code sort of like develops and evolves before you, before you sort you sort of push it out, and then it's on the the front of the internet, right? Is that? Yeah, I, I do. If you want to skip to the next slide, because I can cover off some of these security bits. So, so I quickly put a diagram together to kind of show a very high level view of what kind of our approach to um you know through through development qa and production so at the top we can see that we we have the master branch where all the code is kept we separate the branches off uh, through our policies uh into a development branch and this enables our development team to operate in uh, kind of an isolated uh channel they develop their code locally they merge that code with the branch there's a continuous integration uh, stage which then puts it into their own app service and again it's an isolated app service with an isolated database and they can test the code that they've just created following on from that we have a qa branch um, and we have multiple qas because we we have multiple features that are being developed continuously so this is just a snapshot of how we we approach qa so once the development is completed we push that into the qa branch and then the pipeline initiates and the pipeline is kind of essentially it will build the code that's been written and, and, and um, publish that code into its designated application environments. We have two task one and task two are the publish um, tasks and we have a QA slot, which is for the developers who do the quality testing to uh, uh, make sure that we're not going to impact them when we're doing the security and the security environment is isolated. We can we can push the limits of that. Uh, application without impact in the development QA process. We start then moving on to task three and four, which is, is really the security element where we start looking at how we can ensure the code is secure. So there are four steps to this. We have uh, three automated scans and one manual scan that we complete. So the rapid seven scan uh, automatically initiates when we push the code out and that checks for any CWEs, any weaknesses that are uh, 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 um, apparent within the app and this typically is any um, you know weak elements of code that might be there against a published database and then we can quickly rectify that through our channels. Nessus looks at the CVEs, the vulnerabilities and the enum enumerations. This is anything like, such as the, um, the exchange issue, anything that's been publicly announced as a vulnerability that's present within the app uh, that will scan against that and we can feed that back into the channel to be developed back into QA. Uh, we also perform a number of manual scans, so we check the results from Rapid7 and Nessus. We look to see, you know, are there any vulnerabilities highlighted through these scans that are uh, of a high risk to us that we need to uh, look at further? You know, and, and and is this the point? So which where's the point that we that we do the pen tests? So we do a pen test every scans. time. Yeah. Okay, so we, so we use automated tools to find out where the risks are. 
we then do the manual scans. Uh, so it's, it's verifying what we've identified through the automated testing. We then run Nmap, uh, Metasploit. Uh, we, we scan the blob storage to make sure that there's no vulnerabilities. And this is where the security guys really get their teeth into kind of the, the, the back end to make because sure. Because they are essentially then trying to be a hacker yeah. where there is no known vulnerabilities, a zero day exploit, and trying to hack their way back through the code. Absolutely, that's it. And and you know we we have a team of dedicated, good guys pretending to be bad guys, um, trying to penetrate the app as if they were sat somewhere else, uh, you know, attacking our platform. And, and finally, the Sonar Cube element is just a code quality and, and, and vulnerability exercise. We run our code through uh, this tool, uh, and, and that highlights where there are weaknesses within the, within the code that's been developed. If there's anything that's publicly available through uh, .NET or Java that could uh, identify weakness within the code. Okay, so, so from here, this, this is a way that we've designed it, but I don't think it's something that's realistic that a lot of software providers are doing. And I also don't think that a lot of companies will disclose their process. So I think, you know, you're talking about one application, which is one product, one service, and it's one team who does it. So it's easier to control and monitor. When you're looking at it from a school's perspective, I think we've got in the region of 179 locally installed applications. We've probably got an equivalent number of web applications. Last week alone, I had probably 13 new software requests that were open that I needed to deal with. And what I'm finding is that when I'm actually going in to do larger procurements for bigger systems, so say, for example, a HR system, um, you know, something to do with building management, those sorts of systems are, that do take a lot of data. What worries me a little bit is if we explicitly ask in the contract or the procurement document to say, you know, what are your security measures? What are you doing? Um, often they're responding and saying they're only doing penetration tests once a, once a year or twice a year. They so, so on, on that side of so, so Adam, that, that means they only do this exercise, the task three, once a year. No, so every QA release, which will no, so not us, but, but these, oh. these, 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 these third parties. Yes, hundred percent. Yeah. What worries me though is that if they're doing software releases regularly and they're applying patches or they're doing updates themselves, like we have to do Windows Microsoft updates on a we do them every half term so every six weeks opposed to every four on patch patch tuesday what i think worries me a little bit is if they're doing all these releases and they're not doing the security scans they're releasing code that could be vulnerable now you know we do have vulnerabilities as developers develop so we have to patch them before the code gets released i think what worries me a little bit is that's what's happening for schools and it's yeah. not something that we're aware of so there needs to be some an easier way for schools to do assessments because the sorts of tools that we're getting asked to use are things like online whiteboard applications because we've all been in remote learning. Uh, people want to have the ability to take a, a, a video of their screen and then make sure that they can then send it out and distribute it because, again, we've been doing a lot of remote learning. So the stuff that we're asking for, it's very difficult to unpick it and understand what the company are actually doing. But typically within their contracts, if you've asked for it, they'll state that. Some of the companies are better because they'll say that they're ISO 27001 and they adhere to security standards and they have encryption. But it's as if when you do the exercise for procurement, for the, especially for the larger pieces, you have to put those points into the into the contract request. Yeah, so, I, feel, I sort of feel that like ISO 27001, it's a good you know, it's a good bellwether to say that you know, a company's taking their cybersecurity seriously, but it's like, Going back to the, the examples I gave earlier, it's like uh, Article 25, which is data fiction by design and by default. It's like, okay, where we have the structures, but when you go to Article 32, which is like the, the how you operationalize that, how would you actually operationalize the security in your code build? Now, this is an example of, of, of operationalizing um, security within, within, within your code build. It's not to say that every code build we deploy, we're not going to have any zero day exploits, but it's a way that we are doing the best of what we can. And actually it's probably a lot, it's, it's probably the, the higher end of the, the sort of quartile with what, with what's, with what um, uh, tech providers uh, do to sort of manage the security around their, um, around their applications. And for us as a consultancy practice, you know, we spent 18 months developing our software. Um, if we hadn't developed our software, we wouldn't understand how all this stuff goes together to be able to advise our schools in terms of what they should be looking for, because it is really, really complicated. Um, um, and, I think uh, on that, from a practical perspective, I suppose, you know, we've got, so say, for example, we've got 300 applications and it's growing 
tenfold because of all of the additional types of um, pressure schools are facing from teaching and learning. I suppose it's putting it into different cabs to deal with it. So no, it doesn't access any personal data. And no, you know, as part of our compliance checks now, we're also checking are IP addresses being logged? Are they being tracked? Can the pupils be located? Can they be found? So, you know, if you've got apps where they're all signing up to an event and they and it registers where they are, what time they're going to be there, it's not just the compliance checks, it's also the other things. Um, mm. And then if, this, if the software becomes vulnerable, you've also got to know that what, what were the vulnerabilities? Was it just the personal data? Was it a safeguarding risk? So mm. I think from a practical perspective, put things into cubicles. So it doesn't access personal data. You're not tracking where the pupils are. They don't have to log in. Okay, yes, it does. The next cab could be, yes, it does have personal data. It's got first name, last name, or first name and an email address, a school provided email address, which isn't that clear to understand. So it's harder to identify the pupils. Um, and then the ones that access all sorts of data, and then you start tackling it like almost from the highest risk because yeah. schools have a lot of software. Yeah, yeah. And I think the just this before, before we move on, um, I, I just want to say for, for those that we've got many of our clients on the on the call, and I think what I would say to you is that you know, as a consultancy, we have the you know, we have the expertise to understand how your uh, software providers, how, how their technology goes together. So in terms of your privacy program and your sort of like privacy priorities, have a think about where you'd want to get some of our team involved because many of you already have that as part of your service that's included within your within your um, within your subscription. Um, because it will help you sort of, uh, uh, first of all, upskill your own teams in terms of where the privacy risks are, but also sort of gives you like the armor to, to sort of go into battle um, and ask the right questions of um, your your current uh, providers and your and your future providers. Adam, was there anything else that you wanted to add around this, around this slide here, around the around this? Is there anything here that you've not touched upon? Uh, the only thing I was going to say is the two-factor authentication for me is key, and we we monitor that um, to make sure that all staff have that enabled. Um, you know. The data held within our platform is, is key, um, and we, we ensure that that is is the case for all all members of staff across the organisation. Okay. Um, before we move on to the next, session, I want to say just uh, just thinking about some questions for Simi. I've got a range of questions for her, but if you have any questions around how Hampton is approaching uh, um, cybersecurity, if you have a, a, an Office three sixty five environment, which is what Hampton um, uh, uh, use then get your questions ready and do start posting them in the questions tab. So um, now we're gonna look at this, this evidencing cyber risk management through data. And um, if you've been watching the, the past two or three uh, um, webinars, we sort of give you uh, an overview of what's been happening in the schools in that month. So going back to, I think, September and October. So the theme of the theme of, of cybersecurity is that you, um, and what is sort of required within law, going back to um, Article 32, is that you understand your current level of risk. So data protection law is a risk-based law. One third of data protection law is information and cybersecurity. And, 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 and that is generic across all jurisdictions. So whichever country you go into where they have had a change to the data protection law, those are, those are the key principles. So the expectation is that then you can, so from a cyber perspective, you, you draw a line in the sand and you go, okay, this is where we currently sit, these are our cyber vulnerability risks. You then have a program of activity over a period of time to sort of reduce those cyber risks, and then you do another test, um, and you should better see uh, a reduction in your vulnerabilities and therefore um, a reduction in, 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 in your risks. So sort of put this into, into practice, um, we, we have taken um, a number of schools' results over the past month who have done the retests. So they did the first test in the first half of the year. They've now done um, a second test. And Adam, I just want you to take us through those results. So on the left-hand side on the table there, you've got the risk and vulnerabilities um, average out through a number of schools. Um, and then in 2020, and then on the right-hand side, you've then got the same table, but once they've done the retest in 2021. Yeah, so uh, when I started looking at gathering this data, um, what was interesting was that you know a lot of the schools still had vulnerabilities present. So if we look at the if we take the critical vulnerabilities on the top line, um, there were six critical vulnerability categories that were present uh, in the previous scan, and this time there was three. And actually starting to dive into the data, I started to look at how many devices on a network were actually bringing critical vulnerabilities 
to the table. So the, I think the really important data here is that during the first scans on average, there was around 77 devices on the network which were which were bringing critical vulnerabilities and affecting the school's uh, cybersecurity posture. And on the rescan, uh, because of efforts that have been completed by the client, they've managed to reduce the devices that were bringing the critical vulnerabilities down to five. Um, so that's a significant reduction across the board. Whilst they still had some critical vulnerabilities, it was just reduced significantly. Similarly, with the high vulnerabilities, um, 42 devices bringing them to the table, uh, previous scan, and this time 15. Mediums, 121 down to, down to 19. So again, a significant reduction of devices that were uh, potentially compromising the network. I think on the next slide, Mark, um, we start looking at the categories and where those devices were bringing vulnerabilities. Here we go. Yeah. So um, previous scans, um, there were 66 devices on average that were bringing uh, weak authentication mechanisms to the network. Things like switches without um, uh, authentication, UPS network cards is one that we still find quite regularly. There are two user accounts. There's an admin account, there's an operator account. Please go and check your UPS network cards. I know I've mentioned it before on these webinars, but you still typically find those. Um, I think that's been my favorite trick when I go into a school, yeah. I'm gonna try and hack the UPS. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, a UPS network management card, we can just turn off the power to the UPS. And if all power is driven through that UPS, we could just turn off everything quite quickly. Um, things that we see, you know, um, recently we've had um, uh, like a, a door intercom with video that we've been able to gain access to. We can see people coming in out of the building because of, there's default credentials mm -hmm. in place. MDM platforms, those type of things. So be, be, they're really quick and easy to fix because it's a change of uh, change of password. And because of that, we can see a, a reduction in the vulnerabilities present. So 66 first time, down to three. Um, then we start to see um, the patch management. Again, relatively straightforward to fix. There are known uh, patches available for a lot of the vulnerabilities we find. So it's applying a patch through your maintenance period to reduce the risk to the organization. Uh, then uh, secure configuration, typically uh, TLS or end of life devices that might actually be bringing weak security configuration. We've managed to see a reduction from 116 down to 27. And, and the end of life one is actually quite interesting because there hasn't been a significant reduction in place. And I think that when I've looked at the data, a lot of clients have actually needed to retain some of their end of life software. Um, so it might be 2003, servers 2008 are there for um, for finance or accounting reasons, and they only need to be turned on as and when required. Um, what we have seen is that even though end of life software or services are uh, are on the network, clients have put protections in place. They've they've moved them into secure VLANs with ACLs to minimise the attack surface of those devices. I think that's really important. That was there has been no significant reduction. Uh, that there have been uh, better practices put in place to protect them. Okay, so I think I think this is this this is just a, a good example to show that you you know you, you can never re, re, remove your your cyber vulnerability risk, but what you can do is you can you can seek to manage it and um, and apply your efforts in the right locations um, if you if you have that data. Um, and this screen keeps on moving, so um, so <laughs> and that may be you. So so Sydney on at Hampton, how do you manage your your vulnerabilities? You know, what do you guys do? I suppose, and I, I mean this really politely, I don't mean to contradict anybody, but I think there's two ways of looking at this. So I think a CVA is great for doing like, you know, a whole like big picture review. So that's where we kind of started four years ago. I've been here almost five years. So I think, you know, at the beginning we looked at it, we did um, annual reviews every summer holidays. We got given a huge report, 100 pages. These are all the things that you need to do. This is what you need to get on with. Um, and it was overwhelming. So that was the way that we approached it for the first three years. Um, and our, our governing body here and senior leadership team, we're all about independent audits, making sure that we get clarity, visibility. And from my perspective and my teams, it's all about us getting an understanding from what's going on outside of the school, because often sometimes schools can become a little bit insular. Um, so I think that's one way of doing it. Another way that we've kind of adopted over the last 18 months is we do weekly scans. So rather than waiting, we have bigger detailed scans that happen. But every single Monday morning, my systems manager will run a scan to see 
you know, what are the new vulnerabilities, provide a report back. I would look at where the issues are. That's how we came across the VMware one, for example. Um, and then we'll apply the updates and we'll keep a continuous review and a log. So um, on that, just, just on that, how much time does your systems manager then spend on a Monday doing those updates? Uh, so he'll spend half a day just looking at all of the reports and the analysis and, you know, looking at the plans, the actions, the mitigations that we need to put in place. Um, and putting it in practical terms, I think we have 18 weeks off a year, about eight weeks, eight to 10 weeks of effort for a full time member of staff is taken up by proactive maintenance work that we do. So every morning before 7.30, so we have people arriving from 6.30 in our team, so we're quite a split team. For arrivals, we'll have all the daily checks that are completed. Um, and we use a product called Todoist, it, just so don't put lots of personal data in there, no personal data. I don't think that the compliance checks, are, like the compliant aspect are brilliant, but the proactive alerting, it, it sends us alerts every morning, these things need to be checked. We run through them. If anything's been missed, I can get an alert to say, somebody's not done this check, why hasn't that happened? Um, but I think just some of the practical stuff that Adam's talked about there. So uh, patch management, so patch management's fine. We do ours every half term, so it'll be six weeks. Um, we've had issues this week alone, so we are applied an Aruba upgrade and Aruba have told us to downgrade because it's not working. So yesterday we had math wireless, wireless issues. So sometimes it's difficult knowing that we've moved to a supported version that's secure, but then we actually have fundamental issues and we have to look <laughs> back. So at that point, you, you've got to wait up. Can we teach and can we use the infrastructure because we're a one to one laptop school and iPads or do we run an unsupported version? So there's practical life examples as well that everybody needs to consider. At that point, I think it's a risk exercise talking to the senior leadership team, documenting it, monitoring it, getting on, having support contracts in place so we can call the third party. And um, so that's all the, some examples of stuff that we do. I think we've also had to put in physical security controls that Adam's referring to because some stuff you just wouldn't ever apply the patch because it causes you too many performance issues. So we've done things like our server rooms, um, what, the one on the senior school site, it's a, a one room and then you've got another room. So we've changed the keys to the entrances. And um, so only key members of staff are able to come into the second room. And we've also got, uh, we've got um, a CCTV camera. We also have alerts set up with monitoring tools. So there's different ways of doing it, but I think it's about making it manageable. The reality is my team deals with service systems, security is a, a second byproduct of systems, um, but it does require a lot of effort and resource. So I think CVAs are brilliant. They give you a lot of information, but it's not enough. So it, it's, it's, of, it's, it's operationalizing, isn't it? It's opera, you've operationalized cybersecurity as part of what, your, of what your team do. And that seems to be built on some quite solid foundations. So I know, you know, having been at Hampton for four or five years, you know, what from an engineering perspective, you know, from a technical engineering, what are the sort of projects that you have undertaken to sort of create that foundation for robust for you know robust cybersecurity? Because it, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like you can get a cybersecurity consultant in and go, I'm fine. What have you guys done? Oh, it's been it's been a long, long journey. So if I start, I suppose, um, let's start there's there's systems level changes. Um, there's contract level changes, there's bringing new systems in to help us, and then there's user base changes. So mm -hmm. I think the first thing is we, and Adam mentioned it, VLANs and ACLs. So yes, we can't just stop every single piece of software running. So we used to have a really old piece of software for archives management, um, and we had to segregate it. So it was only one authorized device. It could only be accessed through when it was on the school network. So it was no remote access. So you have to assess which ones are actually out of date. Now we're a big site, so you'll have really weird things like, um, I say weird, but it's normal in a school. We might have a, a machine that powers the, the, the um, what they call sprinklers for, for our football pitch that's running an older version of Windows operating system. It's not here, by the way, but <laughs> that's the sorts of things that we were coming across four or five years back. Um, so it's about scanning the network. It's about getting alerts and having tools in to be able to give us that information proactively. So we did VLANs and ACL. So it's all about segregation, making sure that the right things are in the right places and we limit the, the access. So we would you say, would you would you would you say that's that's a fundamental? That's like a yes. Okay, focus on that first of all before you start doing all the other stuff. Yes, but my only thing is that 
in parts you can't also segregate things because some things need to communicate to each other so there's also the element of risk assessments okay it's about you can't just vlan off everything and say nothing can talk to anything because then you'll find that some odd piece of software doesn't work the way that somebody needs it to so you have to we did our vlans and acls we actually applied access control list on a on a weekly basis so we apply one wait see if we hear any noise do another one wait see if we hear any noise um, that's really similar to how we also do our active directory um, account management. So we, we monitor every six weeks, you know, which accounts haven't been logged in for the last three months. We contact HR. Are these employees still here? Um, is there a reason why, why their accounts are still active? Um, and all of our accounts are managed via our MIS system, which is SIMS. So we use a third party tool that talks between SIMS and active directory and everything links through. So if in SIMS I'm classed as an employee, and I have access to, I'm a math teacher, I will get added to the math department distribution group and I'll get my account and I'll get all the provisions as part of that. So we do user management and it's informed by HR, which is linked back to contracts. Um, so we've done VLANs, ACLs, we've done a huge amount of active directory housekeeping. We've done network intrusion detection. Uh, we did a really interesting project last year was port level authentication. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, um, you cannot plug into any network port, even if they're blanket patched. So schools are amazing at blanket patching. Our IT teams just plug everything in and they, it, it's patched in. And it means that if somebody needs to plug something in, they can. It's a really bad way to do things. So if somebody comes in, plugs in their own personal device with a network cable, they will not get onto the network. And um, so it's great because we get alerts then. And that's all managed again via Active Directory. Uh, we've we put in a guest wireless system, so make life easier for the guests, make it easier for the people that manage large events. So we we get huge amounts of visitors, visitor mornings, prospective parents coming in. So we made that process really easy. Um, we've got a layer seven firewall and uh, uh, policies that have been applied there. We use various monitoring tools, so we're using SolarWinds, IMC. Uh, we use Tenable IO, which is Nessus's cloud product version. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of proactive alerts um, Our third parties. So we have, you know, heating providers that need access to their service, CCTV companies that need access. So we've gone back and done contracts, made sure that the contracts explicitly say they have to have the adequate security measures. So they need to have their devices with antivirus, et cetera. Um, so that's all the systems related things that we've done, which took a long time. And the one thing I would say port level authentication is, is brilliant as is ACLs and VLANs, but you have to plan. So it took us, you know, three months of planning and auditing of the network, making sure we had all the information. The rollout was easy. And um, but then also subsequently the fallout was minimal. Um, from a user perspective, there's a huge amount of things that you can do. And I'm not I'm not a advocate of any products, but Proofpoint is a mail scanning. So it's it's an amazing tool. I don't think a lot of schools use it. It's a very expensive tool, but it filters all of our emails and it really helps because the amount of spam schools will get, especially when you've got generic emails like, I don't know, school office at or, you know, info at. They're the sorts of mailboxes that often get hit or bursary, for example. And um, so we, we, we use Proofpoint and it sends a daily digest of emails. So say, for example... Sorry, um, just on emails. You, you, you said to me yesterday that you don't allow students to have out outbound inbound yes. emails that's another policy so for our younger years pre-prep we our, we have school accounts all the way down to the year two so we have the smallest of the youngest of children having access to email addresses but they're not allowed to be communicated externally so the first thing is the young years nobody with that doesn't have an at hamptonschool.org.uk or a hampton prep or pre-prep account they can't get they can't email them that's a policy that we've applied. The second thing that we've actually done is so year seven, eight and nine, we call them first, second and third. Yeah, they don't have they're not allowed to receive emails unless the domain's been whitelisted. So we've also limited that. So then the fourth, fifth, so year 10, 11, 12 and 13, we've done a lot of training with them. So they're more open. They get emails like a normal member of staff. Um, but it's about putting those measures in. And we've also put in um, a disclaimer at the top of all of our Outlook. It, it happens on both Microsoft 365 and Outlook. It says, a uh, warning, this is an external email. It's bright yellow. Um, it's managed via a policy. So that stops, that automatically makes people realize, okay, this is an external email, be careful. Um, other things that we've done is we've implemented MFA. 
So we have cybersecurity insurance. If we don't have um, MFA, we can't get the insurance. So that's something that's really important to note. Uh, we have MFA applied to all of our staff accounts. Uh, we've also put in things like... And, and on that, I mean, there is... We, I did a conference with the Council of International Schools last week. We had 115 people from 73 schools and some of the pushback was, well, we can't do MFA because the staff just don't want it. You know, the, 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 change, the, the change management is too difficult. Well, I, I suppose I understand where they're coming from wholeheartedly. It was something that we, we've, we've had MFA for two or three years now. Um, I think the first thing I would start by saying is that IT here are exceptionally supported by the senior leadership team and the governing body. So the change management is supported by the management team, which I think is the, the best way that it works, it succeeds. Uh, and my de my my boss, the deputy head, she has an open door policy. So we we explain why we're doing it, and we make this make people understand. You know, this could happen. This is an incident that might arise. This is a vulnerability you might have. So we need to do this. We did that, and subsequently we also did a survey to staff to say, you know, how many of you would be happy with it. Um, and we provided dongles to the ones that really weren't happy. So we gave them, I think we've got probably 16 out in circulation. It cost about 15 to 20 pounds. They're euros actually, because they're, they're a European product. Um, and it's like a small little credit card. So we did that. But for all the other staff, what, how we removed the anxiety was we proved that Microsoft's Authenticator app, it doesn't access personal data. It doesn't know anything about what you're doing. It's just an app that sits on your device that you get a little push notification for. And we've also done things like you don't have to use MFA when you're in the building. So we've whitelisted. So within the organization, it's fine. We've also done things like um, you can remember it. So for 14 days when you've been doing remote learning and we've all been working from home, it remembers the, the, the location for 14 days. Um, something we did last week as well, because People are very intelligent and creative. So there's been a lot of use over time about VPNs. And every time we block a VPN, another one uh, appears. We've also stopped people from being able to log into our Microsoft 365 accounts from any location that's not approved. So right now, we just have the UK and Europe. And we've got a policy where users have to notify 72 working hours before they're, they're due to travel. Um, and you know we do a huge amount of trips normally. So the trips department will also notify us beforehand. Um, that's that's the sorts of practical user stuff that we've done, but it's it's taken us you know 18, 24 months when we did it to make sure that it was all in place. We also implemented security questions as well, so people can reset their passwords remotely. Security questions are there; they can log out of active sessions. So we do a huge amount of monitoring, and those daily checks I mentioned, we will scan to see you know have people I don't know have they signed in from Brazil. Mm. So exactly. it seems to me, it just it seems to me that, like, if anyone's thinking about, okay, how they they want to enhance the security protections of their school, and let let's say they want they, they want they want they want to do it for the new academic year because that's sort of realistic in terms of an engineering perspective. The, the the planning really needs to start now. There's a lot of planning that needs to take place to understand your systems, how they go together, and then to sort of work out, you know, out of all those things that you've said, what 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 are going to be what's going to be sort of like the most benefit for the, for the lowest cost, so to speak? I would look at monitoring, monitoring tools, getting an understanding, do a review, do get a landscape understanding. And I, I don't know, personal preference, we don't do huge development in the summer. I know all schools do it. We develop all year round. We deliver anywhere between 45 and 60 projects throughout the year. And um, what worries me is that when you make change over the summer, you don't have a test bed. So people come back in in September, they were happy, they're now frustrated. So we actually have a development freeze all the way up until November after our half term, the first one. So I think it's all about plan, prepare, review and putting proactive monitoring tools, make smaller system changes like MFA and um, making sure you've got security questions, password right back. So put those sorts of measures in. But when you're looking at things like ACLs, your port level authentication and VLANs, you really do need to do planning. But that would involve scanning your network. And it, there's also, Mark, physical things that you can do. So, you know, all switch cabinets around the building, then the locks on switch cabinets aren't very good. Doesn't matter if you lock them, you hide the keys, whatever. They're not very strong cabinets. So it's looking at them, you know, are there any vulnerabilities? Have we got too many cables? Are the cabinets closed? So it's 
look at everything mm -hmm. how we got too much stuff we used to have five cabinets in our server room here we now only have two and a half like that are utilized so mm -hmm. we've done a lot of housekeeping exercises so i think the first thing that schools struggle with is what do we actually have no yeah. i think knowing your landscape doing your software audits putting in asset management systems and then start to unpick it um, and the way I got the buy-in, first of all, the, you know, they're supportive anyway here, but I think the buy-in was by writing it all down, writing it down yeah. the plan. Because I was going to say, the next, 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 sort of next and one of my final questions was, you know, how have you developed a good working relationship with the, go with the go governing body or in, like, international schools like the school board um, to ensure that the, the, the right resources are provided to manage the cyber risks faced by the school? Well, it sounds like you've answered that question, which is, you've documented it and you've been able to evidence what the risk is and then they've been able to make a judgment in terms of you know basically how much money or how many resources they're going to give you to manage those risks yeah so each year we have a huge list of priorities so i actually have this year next year and the year after so we've already got them and there's core projects that happen every single year so you know we do a safeguarding review of all of our open and allow filtering rules that's a standard project that happens it's, it's quite a big exercise as well so you check all of the changes all the updates that have been applied and we do that every term now actually but we are in a position where you've got this is the core list then from the core list, you, you've got certain things that will happen. Servers are going end of life. You've got switches that have gone end of life in terms of support. So you start to document them and look at your cycle. And then new things come out. So say, for example, Tenable IO brought out something really interesting around active directory monitoring, which is a, a great tool. We need to have a look at it. Um, honeypots, we're setting those up because it's, it's a good idea and makes complete sense. So having somewhere that a hacker can come in and get confused and kind of get themselves caught in a loop, why not? Um, so I think it's about listing it all out, but I think it starts by a really in-depth audit. It's not just a, a CVA mark. It's not just about cyber vulnerability assessment, because I think that's one thing. So the way our department is structured, we do, you know, we have we have training, we do repo graphics, we do compliance, all that sort of stuff. But from an IT component, it's looking at the service that you provide, the systems that you're utilizing and the security of those systems. And it's a three prong approach and it's making, it's kind of creating friction amongst the three people as well and saying, you know, you can have that, but no, but you're gonna impact my users like this. And we do have a division in our team because I think it's important that everybody gets their side of the conversation and the coin out because you can't just patch everything because everything will break. Mm -hmm. so, you need to have an understanding and you need to know how those systems link together so i think that's the first point for me get your plan and if i'm being honest it takes years it takes years to get to the point we are but we are you know touch wood before she's in the press tomorrow with vulnerability. <laughs> but you know we are a, a good oiled machine in that sense and yeah. it happens weekly now there was we had a conversation yesterday about some of the projects that that you got some of the nine team helping you on um one was SharePoint, one was something else, and one was something else. What are those your, if you, if you could provide some more clarity about what those actually are, but those are your priorities now, right? And they're very much like, those are, those are that's about access to data, the access to the right data and the access to the right information. This, uh, this year has been exhausting. I think that's the, probably how everybody in the world is feeling, but also especially in schools, because we had a plan, the plan went in the bin, we adjust the plan, we review the plan, we change the plan. It's constantly changing. But the reality is it's been a good change for us. So we're in a position where we did things like, you know, we've installed cameras in every single classroom. It's all about the blended learning. Now, looking from the systems perspective. So we, just, just, just let me touch upon that one. Just describe, because it's quite innovative, for blended learning, how do your cameras work in a classroom? Oh, it's really interesting. So we bought these, uh, they, they're a Lumens brand camera, and they sit like on a little bracket. It's probably, they're probably only about this big. They're really small cameras. Um, and they sit near our projector, so they capture the teacher's whiteboard. And we've got them on, they can have 87 or 86 settings, I think, but we only have two or three. So one is it goes into the whiteboard, um, and or it goes into the interactive screen so all the project where the projector displays so some of our departments like interactive whiteboards some of them like normal projectors and uh, dry whiteboards so you can zoom in and out and um, but all of the pupil desks are behind so we don't have pupils in the line of sight and we're not recording so it's purely for pupils that ha having to isolate so that you can run lessons remotely the other way that we were using it 
and we, we will continue to, is that if the teacher can't be in because they're having to isolate because somebody in their family is being affected. And so, 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 so this is how it works, right? So you've got a camera set up by the projector facing the teacher. The teacher can do a Teams lesson for students that are remotely, select the view that they want to show, which is like either a wide screen or narrow screen just on, the, on, on Teams, very easy to use. And then the students at home get the same experience as if they were in the lesson. Yeah, that's it. And how, and how much does how much do those cameras cost per cam per per? You know, you don't need to say it's about they, were they about hundred pounds or two hundred pounds? No, I think it's more than that. I don't know. We installed them last year. Okay. So I'll I'll double check and I'll let you know so you can show. That. <laughs> but it was a relatively low cost, a low cost to give a, a significantly high you no know, to give the same teaching experience to or well, learning experience really low cost it's where you value it so we value the pupils getting that level of teaching co teacher content con contact and experience so we've got you know in the science rooms where you've got the science bench it zooms in on the bench so a teacher can do a live experiment but then for in dt when you're talking about different machines and 3d 3D machines, etc. You you can't do that. So we provided an iPad with a tripod. So we've looked at different ways of teaching, and um, and I think what going back to your original point about Microsoft 365, I think from my perspective, it's about looking at how teachers have taught over the last year. So a lot of people have put in things like OneNote. They've gone in and done a huge amount of innovation, which is fantastic. But we've got to catch up, IT have to catch up. So notebook A, so say for example, Adam's pupil one, he's, he, and I taught him this year, but Mark, you teach him next year. Yeah. His pupil notebook needs to now transfer from me in September and be available for you. So that digital filing system and OneDrive mm -hmm. and localized network shares because schools, the way that we work and Microsoft 365 doesn't support things like the 2D design machine. It won't support things like the Active Inspire file format. So it's really important to look at all of those. We've got 25 and a half thousand files that aren't supported by Microsoft 365. So we're looking at localized storage and then you've, we've got to make sure we're backing it up. So a huge amount of change that's coming. Software as a service has been quite, you know, everybody knows about that. Um, it's infrastructure as a service and it's changing and then it's security. So everything new we've brought out, we, we have to evaluate the security and then look at the compliance. So we have a process where a request comes in or a project happens, compliance checks happen, safeguarding checks happen, then it comes to IT. Mm. IT, we're the last people because if it hasn't passed safeguarding, it shouldn't be checked from compliance. And then if it hasn't checked from compliance and been approved, it shouldn't, shouldn't get to IT. Great. So we're sort of out of time um, and uh, over time, in actual fact. So what we'll do is that if anyone wants to speak to Simi, then um, on a one to one basis, then I'm sure that will be fine. Just if you just let one of the nine team know and they can put you in contact with um, with Simi. Um, for me, like the there are a number of takeaways. Um, there are uh, the whole range of things. And like Andre was saying that's a lot of good info. Can we have this documented somewhere that you can share? Um, what we'll do is we'll ask one of our team to take a look, see whether we can write some you know, some good blog, uh, some, some blog information, and put it into in terms of in terms of in terms of blog. Um, and for all the things and all the things that um, that we've spoken about today, they, these are these are um, that we have experts in nine that obviously support Hampton, but also support a whole range of different schools. So as a as a business, we're not just theoretical. We are working with these types of problems every single day, coming up with solutions. And if you have these types of problems with anything that, that we've discussed today, we've probably done it before, and we probably have a solution that you that's going to save some time and some, some cost. Um, and many of our schools are probably choosing to go for the security and systems um, uh, service because that includes a comprehensive audit and assessment and also wrapping up all of your issues into projects um, based upon your strategic um, strategic priorities. And if you are a client and you're watching this and you're you know, wanting, you know, you've sort of got a, a more of a, a more of an in-depth understanding of what we do, any of those things that we've spoken about, if you speak to your, one of your, your lead consultant and, and want to do the same types of projects, then um, then let them know um, and they can they can get that sorted. Um, so if they aren't any other questions, um, I'd like to uh, thank thank Adam uh, again for this session. Uh, Simi, uh, really appreciate. You. I know the the kids, the boys are back in school yesterday, and this is your first back in. Um, 
is your first day back in school. So uh, really, really thank you for your time. I'm sure everyone's greatly appreciated on, on that. I've seen some great, great, great comments. Um, the next session that we do, when, when me and Adam pull these sessions together, we sort of, let's sort of think about the, the content at the last minute. So there'll be another one, strategically think about it at the last minute. There'll be another one that we do in um, in in April and um, we will probably have another guest presenter on because they're, I think they're really, really useful to get the, sort of the context um, and uh, that'll be published in due course. So um, keep an eye out um, for, uh, for, for those communications. And then, uh, yeah, if you need any help, then then get in touch. Uh, thank you very much for your um, for your time today. And all the references will be in the um, there we go in the uh, in the PDF I get sent out. So thanks, Simi, and thanks, Adam. Thanks, thanks everyone.